And as usual, I will start with the take-home message. And the take-home message is that the number of prescriptions for particular drugs and amphetamine Adderall-like drugs has been increasing substantially in the US. Um, that's for the last several years, but particularly during COVID and after COVID. And as we talked about in one of the recent talks here, the FDA is that many of these drugs are being shared with people they were not prescribed for, including a substantial number of people who have not received any formal diagnosis of ADHD. So more and more people, both with diagnoses and without diagnoses of ADHD are getting stimulant medications. And for years, the dogma on DD websites and across mental health sites in general is that stimulants clearly help people with ADHD to perform better, to reduce like likelihood of suicide, reduces their likelihood of becoming drug addict. Broad consensus stimulants do work for people with ADHD. And there's actually a consensus that stimulants help for athletic performance for people in general. Um, we know they increase heart rate, they increase blood pressure, they increase reduce reaction time. That's why stimulants are universally banned by almost every athletic organization. But the dogma that's sitting out there is that stimulants Cognitive effects for people without ADHD is minimal or distant. Um, part of it's clearly designed as a message if you don't really have ADHD, you don't belong taking these medications. But I think we are over reading the amount of data that comes to that, that, uh, that comes to those conclusions. And I'm going to jump into three different studies that were done in the last five years, all of which received fair amounts of attention in the popular press, particularly the, the last two I'll talk about. Um, and the message in the popular press, again, was strongly stimulants don't do anything good for people who don't have ADHD. I think, again, that's an overstatement. So I'm going to start in a slightly, not offbeat area, but what I think under a, a foundational study done in 1908. So as I tell my children, that was way before I was born actually even before one of my grandmothers was born. And it's called the Yerkes dodson inverted U for arousal versus performance um, chart or graph. And they had other data in their study. They didn't actually map out this actual curve, but the curve is if you're looking at arousal, if you increase arousal, starting from, if, if you're starting with someone who's asleep or barely awake or barely registering, performance is gonna be poor. If you increase arousal, you increase performance, and it goes up fairly steadily until you reach some plateau or optimal area of performance. And then within that sweet spot, if you keep increasing arousal, you're not getting much change in performance. But if you continue to increase arousal, then performance drops off. So again, that curve is up level and then drops down. So again, an inverted U shape. And that means if there's too much stimulant, stimulation, you get too hyperactive, you get too distracted, you go off track, you don't perform as well. So that's a well-known phenomenon. And when I started working with individuals with ADHD, adults with ADHD about 30 years ago, that was sort of the core explanation for why do stimulants even help people with ADHD when they make everyone else too revved up and jittery? And the claim was both groups of people are showing a similar inverted use shape for arousal or performance. It's just that people with ADHD have their curve shifted, as we say, to the right. So someone with ADHD needs a higher level of arousal to get to that same or get to an optimal, optimal level of performance. And someone without ADHD would be bouncing off the walls and already on the downward slope that that, that stimulant is too much for them. Um, and that makes, I think that is still a basic useful um, explanation. There's, although uh, Yerkes Dodson inverted U makes its appearance pretty much in every Psych 101 textbook. And disclaimer, I never took Psych 101 or never even took an undergraduate psych course. Um, it's sort of universally accepted as a general truth, whether it's true in absolutely all conditions or what are the exceptions to that curve or truth? 
or variations of it, but let's just assume or take it as a useful rule of thumb or generalization that has some good validity. So one other thing that the difference between ADHD individuals with ADHD and non-individuals without ADHD emphasize is that even within the ADHD population, there is incredible individual variation in sensitivity to dosage of stimulants. And I've talked about that in another um, talk on here on YouTube. So, and I'll quote the same people or uh, patients. So I have one patient, 300 pound truck driver, five milligrams of Adderall, was about right, sometimes too much, maybe two and a half would be more optimal, but, but five was good, 10 was clearly too much for him. Clearly had ADHD, clearly benefited from it when he was on the Adderall. And I worked with sisters who were average in size and both clearly had ADHD, primarily um, inattentive ADHD, and one needed as much as 180 milligrams, one needed as much as 240 milligrams of Adderall, no signs of hyperactivity, um, high blood pressure, increased heart rate, no problems with it, but that's what they require to function. So even within ADHD, there's a broad range in sensitivity dosages, and this is gonna be important at the very end of my talk. So three studies I'm gonna talk about. The first one is just a meta-analysis that was done in 2020 by a group out of Liverpool. They looked at several hundred studies, and um, out of those 40, met their criteria and they were looking at studies that you looked at methylphenidate or Ritalin, studies that looked at um, dextroamphetamine or dexedrine, and studies that looked at modafinil or provigil. And they were looking at, since so many studies look at different cognitive domains or realms, they chose eight different um, target cognitive realms to look at. And they looked at some of these are classified as executive functions in some lists. People parse the executive functions differently. So those eight realms were how well people were at updating information, how well they were performed at switching tasks or cognitive mindsets to solve problems, how well they had control over inhibition when presented with a stimulus that told them to stop, um, how well they accessed long-term memory, how well they performed on spatial working memory tasks, how good their memory recall was, and how good their selective attention was, and how good their sustained attention. And again, this is a meta-analysis, so looking at all the studies put together, their finding was that methylphenidate had weak overall effects on cognitive functions to improve it. These are in non, on people without ADHD, um, but of those eight specific domains, methylphenidate only measurably helped improve performance in three, inhibitory control, recall, and sustaining attention. When they looked at modafinil, again, they could find a weak, tiny overall benefit in cognition from modafinil, but the only one of those eight um, domains that they found modafinil helped with was updating information. And then with dextroamphetamine, and I think there were more than 40 studies that made it, and some of those studies looked at more than one of these drugs, about a dozen studies looking at dextroamphetamine, and overall, they didn't find any overall cognitive benefit, and they didn't find any benefit on any of those eight more specific breakout executive function tests. So their conclusion was these are substances that have significant whether we call it high rate, but measurable rates of addiction, possible really bad side effects of psychosis, particularly with Adderall, um, potential for cardiac effects, potential for interfering with growth in children. Um, so their overall claim was that stimulants have such mild to minimal effects on boosting cognition in people without ADHD that pretty much you shouldn't be considering them. So that's that's sort of the, the groundwork I'm pressing. Then in 2018, there was a study out of Brown University that got a fair amount of attention in the popular press. And that study looked at only 13 people. Um, they gave them all the same 
dose, 30 milligram dose of Adderall. And then they measured them starting about an hour and a half of dosing to about three and a half hours. So that was when levels should be peaking. And the good thing or that, that had not been done before was to simultaneously measure not just cognitive functions, on which they used a battery of cognitive function tests, but they also measured autonomic function, physiologic, blood pressure, heart rate, and they measured subjective both mood effects and could you tell whether you're on a drug and did you like this drug effect? So their study found that on cognitive effects, this dose of Adderall had pretty minimal benefits or decrements. So there's tiny effects on improving attention. There's a tiny slight decrease in reaction time. There was um, a slight decrease in commission errors of commission and a slight decrease in the variability of um, responses. But there's also a slight but measurable decrease in ability to recall digit span. So in effects on cognition were extremely small. Most measures didn't reach statistical significance. None of these were big robust effects. On the other hand, effects on blood pressure, increasing it, effects on heart rate, and effects on subjective experience. Yes, I'm on something, and yes, I really like taking it, were substantial. The mood effect was actually the largest effect. People really liked it. And again, this study got lots of attention, and the conclusion was you know, people are liking this. That's a big potential for addiction and certainly affecting physiologic variables and it has a minimal effect on cognitive performance. So people shouldn't be using it because it's not having any real benefit and it's having lots of detrimental effects. And then a similar, but not methodologi methodologically different test just came out a few weeks ago. This was out of a group, Elizabeth Bowman's group in Melbourne, Australia. And in addition to some standard um, tests that measure different aspects of executive function, they decided, so they were using either placebo or a 30 milligram dose of Ritalin or a 15 milligram dose of dextroamphetamine or a 200 milligram dose of modafinil. There were repeated trials a week apart of this study. So everybody at least when randomized got um, placebo once and each of these drugs at least once. Um, the number study, only 40 individuals studied. Again, they were studied up starting about an hour and a half of, after dosing. So hopefully at a time when these drugs were having their robust effects. And in addition to those, a set of standard um, cognitive tests, they decided to use a test that was um, what they call mathematically complex or hard. So many of the tests for executive function are designed to be really simplistic. So you're pushing a button to when you see a symbol there versus there, or you are doing a maze where you're moving from one to two to three to four up across a messy crowded figure. Those are fairly simplistic tests that many of them are designed to be simple to extract just one variable, but they don't have a lot to do with real life functioning. And this test that they used, which is called the knapsack optimization test. So you're told you have a knapsack, this is on the computer and you have to put different objects in it. And your goal is to fill it to the highest amount without going over the weight threshold. Um, so Again, mathematically, it can be shown this is a much more complicated test, and they argue that it's much more like many of the real world challenges people face, like how do you prioritize or triage or deal with all the tasks you have to do today? Or um, how do you get a task done in an environment where there's lots of conflicting demands upon your time? So again, with, so with this test, what they demonstrated was that For each individual, so overall, about half the time, whether the person was on the placebo or whether they were on one of the drugs, about half the time they reached the optimal result. So there's one optimal answer for the different assortment of objects you're putting in the knapsack for each trial of this test. Um, 
So overall, the, the performance in terms of how many times they got the best answer didn't differ. But if you looked at the average test score, all of the drug groups or all the drug trials, people underperformed how they did on the placebo. So if you just looked at the average of how many items they got into the, the knapsack, it was less than they got in. And, and again, you're never allowed to exceed the total weight um, than they got in with the placebo group. And when they looked in more detail, what they saw was the measure of effort. So how much time someone spent deciding, should I put in this object next or this into the backpack? And the number of steps someone took um, to keep putting things in, putting them out, making choices and decisions, effort or pers perseverance, however you want to call it, was greater on all three of these substances than it was on placebo. But the productivity or actually the quality of the choices was inferior. So you might have spent more time thinking about it, but you actually made a lousier choice. And measurably, they were sort of assessing for different algorithms or strategies <laughs> that the people were trying to presumably using to fill the bags. And um, the results when you were on any of these three drugs seemed to be more random than the strategy algorithm plotting thinking that was involved when that same individual was on placebo. So there's also what I would call a leveling effect. So people who did worst on the placebo test, some of them did a little better with the drugs. Um, some of them who did high on the placebo test did a little worse. So there was some tendency towards, I guess, regression towards the mean, but overall, individuals, regardless of which of the three drug conditions, again, each of them got all three across the different trials of the studies separated in time, made you perform worse. And again, the media has jumped on this as saying, yeah, you're making decisions. You may be more motivated. You may be working harder, longer, persevering at your task, but you're performing more stupidly on these tasks with any of these brain enhancing drugs. So, my big problem with all these studies, you know, I'm not disputing that they weren't trying to do them carefully and, and that the individual results, I'm not thinking they faked them or, or did anything bad there, but I think there's a serious flaw in picking just one dose of a drug and then making blanket claims about it. So, and, and particularly the finding that 30 milligrams of people revved people up, but they didn't perform well, all that tells us to me is on our performance, um, arousal performance curve is that we've overshot arousal and we're already on the downside getting bad performance. Does that tell us that stimulants aren't gonna help people to focus or perform if they don't have ADHD? Absolutely not. It's saying you probably chose a bad dosage for this. Um, so, that's about all I will say is that we need to do much better studies before we go around making blanket claims that these drugs don't do any good for anyone without ADHD. And again, those claims are being made. Um, I think it's up to each individual and maybe their doctor and consultants to just you know, figure out whether the risks of these drugs exceed the benefits for that individual. But to claim that and, and again, part of the other strangeness is that everything we know suggests ADD-ness is on a spectrum of severity. So are we saying that it's only the most severe or only the fully classically meeting at least enough DSM-5 criteria we're gonna benefit? And if you have one less criteria or you only have it much of the time rather than most of the time, you're not gonna benefit. That seems to me pretty silly. But again, the overall thing highlights if you're taking any of these drugs, whether you have ADHD or not, matching the dosage to your side effects and to your potential benefits is highly important. So that's a little shorter than I've some of my other talks, but I see there are questions. So I will stop the official presentation right there and move on to the questions. Um, so hello, Dennis.
Dennis saw we ought to prescribe more stimulus to the public. It'll make people more focused. It'll make people more focused and energetic. Productivity will go up and the added benefit of addressing the obesity crisis. Um, and Dennis acknowledges he's joking a little bit. Um, but he, he brings up, which I haven't addressed at all, that there are certainly philosophical issues as to whether cognitive enhancing is helping everyone to perform better or whether it's a form of cheating. Um, and as he points out, one of the, the major ethical issues there is certainly there would be unequal access that people have health insurance or have access to doctors or have access to good dealers or more financial resources are gonna be more able to access these items. That's absolutely true. Um, and it's interesting again, where we make a clear cut distinction in the sporting world where any of this doping, any of these abuse is and has been and continues to be rampant. Um, interesting group that's actually scheduled the first, and I'm forgetting the name of it, um, enhanced Olympics, let's call it. So they are inviting people who are using drugs to compete in physical events to help destigmatize the use of these drugs for physical athletes, not just for cognitive performance. Um, so it's certainly an, addition, an idea our society needs to struggle with. Um, certainly if these drugs, and I'm not saying they have it all, helped people to think more critically and assess the information that they are being fed by various sources and see if it fits into any real historical truths or patterns or fits into a logic or internal, internal consistency. I'd say if we had a drug that did that, it would be a boon absolutely to society to have more people that think in that way. If it's being used just to turn out more people doing grunge work or work that they're not particularly motivated to do anyway, then I'd certainly have more qualms about whether that makes sense or who it's good for, whether it's good for the employers rather than the individuals. Um, so another comment, the great artiste says, I find dosage to be really critical as well as the delivery systems. Um, and he laments he or she, sorry, for assuming gender. Um, lamenting the loss of authorized generic concerta. So I've been searching for the closest substitute so far. Metadate 10 milligrams is working well for that individual. Um, the other thing to note and Supplies have been spotty in the San Francisco area. Um, but brand name Ritalin, I mean, sorry, brand name Concerta is still being made. Again, it was being made in the exact same factories, laboratories as the generic branded Concerta was. Um, both subsidiaries of Johnson & Johnson. One of my other talks about the Concerta problem is on this YouTube site. And many insurers have been paying for branded Concerta under the um, explanation that none of the other forms of methylphenidate that are there are bioequivalent to branded Concerta. So I've had that work multiple times with a couple of different insurers to get patients covered. Um, sometimes it is a higher copay, but usually that's substantially covered better than if you had to pay out of pocket. And Grand Artiste chips in that he tried both Ritalin LA and Focalin XR at the two lowest dosages and they did not seem to work well for him. Um, and with his cover, that person's coverage, the $400 a month is much steeper than the $40 a month. So again, one thing to check is whether a tier exception is available. If your doctor's willing to argue the case, your insurer, a second option to at least look up is goodrx.com. And I don't usually advertise, but g-o-o-d-r-x.com has a website. One, it will tell you the prices of medications at different pharmacies. And at least in the Bay Area and other areas I've checked, 
there are times when, and it's often Costco that's the lowest, Costco may be 10 times cheaper for certain drugs than will be CVS or Walgreens. Um, and two, goodrx.com often has coupons that anybody can download. They don't need permission from the manufacturer or anything like that. That can also help lower the price. The downside of using the GoodRx coupons, one is that even though they advertise everyone honors them, that's not the case. Um, and two, and whether your privacy concerns are worth the risk or not, that means that you are in a database and GoodRx makes its money by sharing um, understanding it has to be the um, de identified data, but they are sharing data with other sources when you download coupons from their site. Um, so that's, I think we've covered everything. I hope the rest of you stay healthy and happy. And next week, hopefully I will be healthy and happy enough to talk again. It's a non-ADD topic, but, but I'll bring in ADD aspects and it's, it's new technologies are being used to track medication compliance. So stay healthy, stay happy, and I will be back next Tuesday. That's all. <laughs>